Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's Folio Forum, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Eric Hartnett. I'm the Director of Electronic Resources at Texas A&M University and the host for today's event. Our topic today is Application Program Interfaces, or APIs. Today's session, like all Folio Forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. As an open forum, participants can see all questions submitted and we have muted everyone except for the speakers to ensure good sound quality. We value your participation and encourage you to engage in the topic. Use the Q&A box within Zoom to enter your questions and comments as they come to you. The speakers will address the questions at the end of the presentation. If you'd like to tweet, please use the Twitter hashtag Folio Forum. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on this topic on the Folio discussion website discuss.folio.org. Our speakers today are two of my colleagues here at Texas A&M, Beth German, service design librarian, and James Creel, software application developer. So I'm gonna turn it over to them. Hi there, uh, welcome. So uh, as Eric mentioned, today's uh, presentation is Introduction to Folio APIs, What's the Buzz? Um, and so today we are going to be going through um, just an overview of APIs and the, the reasons that we want to talk about them today and what we hope the learning outcomes are is that uh, everyone who participates will be able to describe the purpose and design of an API so that you can converse with your colleagues about their capabilities um, and then also be able to explain the API framework that Folio uses so you feel confident knowing how the components of the software interact with each other. So this won't be like a deep dive into how to use Folio APIs, but it will be a broad overview of APIs generally. Um, so today's uh, agenda is that we'll do an overview of interfaces, uh, then go over APIs, move into how APIs are used in web applications, which Folio is a web application, um, use some examples and actions, and I think that will help really clarify about how different APIs are used and what all the put the pieces of the puzzle together um, and then we'll talk about folio APIs. So to start off API when we say that what do we mean it's an application programming interface so it's an interface for programming applications um, and to really understand this, we kind of have to think about what an interface is, because I think interface isn't really an intuitive word here, that uh, when we think about interfaces, we think about things that we use, like our phones, a microwave, any type of um, things that facilitate an exchange as an interface. And so these can include the ports on your computer, um, it can include websites. Uh, interfaces is all, are all around us and like the way Zoom. Zoom is an interface for this webinar. So um, there's these things that we can touch and these things that make sense to us. And then we start getting into this idea of the intangible interfaces, the stuff that you don't actually physically interact with. And those are a little harder to grasp. And those are where APIs and the way computers work together um, kind of uh, live. So what are interfaces? I'll let James kind of start talking about um, the different families of interfaces and try to get the context of where APIs fit into this broader sphere. Yeah, and when we were um, trying to um, uh, come up with a way to communicate the nature of an application programming, programming interface to people who aren't programmers, um, it became clear that um, you can provide a lot of context by talking about interfaces in general so that you know um, what you're talking about when you're talking about APIs and what you're not talking about because there are a lot of interfaces that are in, in quite different categories. So um, interfaces at, at a high level can be determined um, or categorized by the participants. Um, so there's kind of a spectrum, you know, between uh, interfaces that are uh, rather inhumane in a, not in a, not in a pejorative sense, but um, in a technical sense. Um, so interfaces that are just strictly between machines um, you also have interfaces um, where humans interact with machines. So um, the interface on your phone, any kind of uh, user interface where you um, are dealing with software as a human. And then of course, uh, humans have interfaces between themselves. So we use um, natural language to communicate with each, with each other at the very um, um, extreme end of the spectrum there. Um, now among the machine interfaces, um, we have the application programming interfaces and we also have uh, hardware interfaces. And so th those are, 
extremely technical and usually um, involve you know the transfer of bits across wires. Um, but kind of at a higher level um, for APIs, you know, a programmer of, of Java is going to interact with the Java program using the Java APIs. Um, now, a programmer of um, a web application is uh, going to be using um, typically a REST API, and REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and we don't really need to get into the technical details of that, but it is worth noting that it occurs over HTTP, which is the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and um, that's um, exactly the kind of API that uh, Folio employs for web development purposes, and we're also going to put that in some further context by looking at some other um, APIs that we work with uh, here in the libraries. Anything else on that point, Beth? Yeah, no, I think that's great. So um, thinking about um, the components of an API, really what's happening is you have a request and you have a response coming back. Like one way to uh, think about this is maybe a server at a restaurant or like a, the wait staff. And so you take, you have a menu and you give them your order. They take that order into the kitchen. The kitchen makes food and does processing. And then that waiter brings back your food. And so that's kind of what is happening in this API exchange is that there is a request that goes out, something happens, and then a response comes back. Um, and so one of the other, anything more to say on that kind of like a general overview? Uh, uh, well, it, it, it's maybe worth it to talk about kind of why we're having this uh, webinar in the first place. And um, so, uh, a, a, a web development API is um, going to be a um, peculiarly technical development and the um, the form of the requests and the form of the responses it's all happening over HTTP and um, well the uh, interactions are, are not done at a, at a human level however it ultimately has to be humans that do the design of the APIs and it will be humans who are the computer programmers of the service that implements the API, as well as of the websites and the web pages that utilize the API to get the information that the end user wants. And um, so, um, in spite of the technicality of it, it's important to get a variety of stakeholders familiar with um, an API for a given project, um, stakeholders beyond just the developers themselves. And um, so, ways you can go about that are uh, providing documentation for your APIs. Um, soliciting community involvement, which I hope we're um, achieving to some degree here today, and um, also doing demos and, and workshops and that sort of thing. Yeah, um, and one of the things to note too is that like um, one of the things that we're always seeking is alignment between all the different agents when you're creating things. And so the developer who's writing an API might not be the same developer who's creating software, and that's completely different than the user. And so you're all trying to fulfill that user need and maybe not have the most direct um, paths to each other and or even communication between the software and the APIs because the APIs um, in the folio case are all kind of local, but then there's all these external integrations that you could do too, uh, where you're, you have no relation to, to the people writing the APIs. So while these are the APIs are computer to computer, there's still a whole lot of human, um, it's still human built. Absolutely. So um, let's provide some more um, precision for uh, what we're talking about here then kind of in, in more context. Um, so in this diagram, um, we can see the, the end user is interacting with their computer. They type on the keyboard, use the mouse, um, they um, view the screen, they see the content of the web page, and um, sort of that view of the web page that um, is uh, feeding the UI hardware, that is um, the user interface software itself. And so in a web application, your um, user interface, which is um, um, a distinct computer program in and of itself, it typically will consist of um, an HTML website uh, styled with um, some cascading style sheets and then um, some JavaScript that does the actual uh, work of communicating with an API. And again, that's going to be done over the hypertext transfer protocol and um, it'll communicate with the API gateway at the, at the back there. That's going to be the server that is going to accept those requests and provide um, specific responses based on those requests. 
Okay, so um, now we'll get even more precise by looking at some real examples of what this kind of thing looks like in reality. Um, and so it, this is live, so um, fingers crossed, right? Absolutely, <laughs> the, magic, the magic power of demos to make things go yeah. oddly, but we'll see um, how this plays out for us. Um, so some of you may be familiar with this uh, fun little web service called uh, JS Fiddle. It allows you to write mm -hmm. some can you expand it? Oh, yeah. I'll make, let me expand this a little bit so it's easier to see. And is this uh, coming up on the screen for everyone? It is not. So we're still seeing your PowerPoint. So oh, okay. Oh. You sure? One moment. How's that, Eric? Got it. Excellent. Okay. And I'll increase the font size for legibility a bit here. Okay, anyway, uh, this JS Fiddle service, um, it allows you to kind of experiment with uh, web pages and um, if you care to with APIs that are external. Um, so we have here a very simple HTML website. It just has a nice little header at the top, a little bit of text, and then a button. We can see the rendering down here in the um, uh, lower right-hand quadrant. Um, there's just a little bit, of, little bit of styling on that page just to get rid of the serifs with um, the use of some fonts. Um, and then what's perhaps more interesting is uh, some script data down here. Um, so this is a um, script in the JavaScript language, which is ubiquitous in um, web application development. And um, we see here an example of uh, some JSON, that's a JavaScript object not notation. People love to look at this kind of thing in presentations, I know. Um, so. Um, this is just a sample of what the kind of data that you might get from an API looks like. And if I come down here and I, uh, in my little button function here, we see we have a listener applied on the class button. And indeed up here in the HTML, there is a button to um, accept that kind of call on a click. So, and what it's gonna do is gonna call this get local data method. And that local, get local data method is gonna just avail itself of the local data that was defined up here in JSON, and um, then just do some simple interactions with it. It's going to um, basically append uh, the information found in the data um, to rows in a list. And we see that very list right here on the, uh, on the HTML page. So I'll update the JavaScript, I'll click the button, and voila, we do see that um, the script processed the data and provided some human readable output for us there. Yeah, and so one of the things that this is illustrating is that this type, the, the, this name, item one, number one, description, that's the data that's going to come back to the JavaScript, to the, the software um, from the API, and then you have to do processing on it. So it's really trying to illustrate about how the API itself is not doing this processing that you still have this the software that does that um, and that you typically just get this data back and then have to do something with absolutely it. That, that's the kind of kind of an important point about it um, is um, APIs are there to serve the data but not to do the formatting of the data and they, they can do some processing of the data but other processing of the data will be done on the front end so <clears throat> and this is really just by way of example we're gonna see some more realistic examples in a second here but you see I've done an edit to the data now and I can update that JavaScript and run it again. And um, what's worth noting is that the um, amended data is getting processed, but I didn't have to do any work um, in the context of my method here that gets and processes the data. So a change to the data uh, manifests through without you having to do changes to the program per se. Okay, so, um, and let's see the next example. Um, the next example I wanna show is um, not just fake play data, but it's gonna be some real data that actually comes from an inter internal application we have here in the libraries that we call the directory app. And it's basically an online um, web application to provide a staff directory. And um, I'm gonna wanna show you an example of an API request made to um, the directory service and the kind of data you get back. So what's really nice to see up here, and I'm sorry this is small, but oop, we do see this uh, URL. So calling uh, api.library.tmu.edu, and then under there we have 
an endpoint for uh, the directory, and then it accepts um, further uh, pathing to this LDAP, and then um, we want to get all. So um, this is all uh, quite convention driven, and um, uh, basically the software developers, based on um, requirements from the you know customers for the directory service, um, decided that they would um, come up with such a, a format for these requests. But um, a variation on that that might be. Oh, oh, sure. And this is um, just kind of the way we've internally chosen to structure our data. Our um, APIs uh, typically um, give back two components in the JSON. There's this meta area that tells you whether you're, uh, you know, kind of information about your request, like whether, whether it was successful or not. And then down in the list of the, this payload here, it's going to be a list of um, basically the information coming back. And this is the directory giving you um, all the results, all the results for the people in the directory. And this is all public on our, uh, our website again, so we're not showing anybody any confidential information here. But um, by way of example, I wanted to show an alternative request that you might make. Instead of doing all at this endpoint, um, you might instead request faculty. And then I'm going to get a more filtered uh, result set out. So. Yeah, but like, so if I though wanted to just get my information, uh, I couldn't just type in something, right? Like I couldn't just type in my username here because that's not how it was designed. And so, you know. Yeah, so this, this doesn't work. Yeah, so it, it, you have to always, your calls are going to match how it's designed. Um, and so that's when we were talking about alignment is the alignment we're seeking. So the developers would have need to known that I wanted to be able to pull my information by my ID um, it, to get information back. Uh, but without that kind of user requirement, that didn't get built into the system, and so it's not there. So there's always a very defined way that you have to structure these um, API calls, um, and there's a defined way that they come back. And if there, if the if it wasn't programmed in, there isn't a way to to go get that data. Yeah, quite so. And we will so we'll see some um, more examples of that when we look at the um, Folio API in a moment here. But uh, coming back to the JS Fiddle. Um, so the directory data, we have some sample directory data that actually, actually in the JavaScript. Um, we had to do this just for demonstration purposes because um, the uh, access to uh, that API is, is locked down, as a matter of fact. And so JS Fiddle is not able to go through the internet to get to um, an internal Texas A&M University API. Um, so for demonstration purposes, we just went ahead and put it right here in the in And the I fiddle. think that's a good point about the difference between closed APIs and open APIs. and so. There's AP, APIs that are written for internal programming, but then there's open APIs. So like the Facebook API is something that um, people can code against or like the Google Map API is something people can code against and they're just open to the public where there's that public information. Right, or at least subsets of their APIs. Okay, so there's um, the example of um, processing some directory data. And then finally... So that's nice too, because like you can see that we are only processing some. So a lot of data came back, but we only wanted to display the username uh, and email. And so um, when you get that data back, you get to make a lot of choices about what happens. Right, right. Okay, so let me see, what, what do we need to show next? Um, a folio example? Okay, so um, yeah, finally here, um, we'll use this last method, the get folio data. And again, we have um, some example folio data right here. And um, it's perhaps more illustrative to look at it in this context where um, we see an actual simulated call to a, um, I guess it was, this would be you know, a copy endpoint actually. Uh, for the user's module. And uh, we can see that the uh, endpoint is structured in a little bit of a different way from um, the um, Tamu Libraries API here. Can you define an endpoint for me? Uh, endpoint, uh, just, <laughs> well, the address at which you're making the requests okay. against the API. Yeah, so there are many different addresses. Um, one, one such address here is slash folio slash users. Okay, so, um, and in this instance, instead of um, actually putting the pertinent details in 
the uh, URL itself, as we see here, we're putting some pertinent details in the query parameter. So um, use this question mark notation and then um, set a parameter equal to a certain thing. And this is the way the um, um, Okapi users module is uh, structured at this, at this endpoint. It um, accepts an ID of this kind of form. And um, here's what you get back with some, here's a canned response for that um, kind of request. And um, this is all uh, documented in, um, under the auspices of the um, Folio project. And we see the documentation here for um, this endpoint that I'm hitting for this particular um, uh, module. And we do see that under the slash users path, um, there is um, acceptable a query. That's gonna be a string. And um, here's an example of how you might um, make that sort of thing happen. Yeah, so this is what API documentation typically looks like where they explain to you what are the parameters that you can put in, what's going to be that request going out, and then they tell you what the expected response back is going to be. Um, so like if we look here, there's a series of metadata um, about what parameters you'll be able to see. So that means that if you were trying to get something that wasn't there, it's just not there, and so you can't get to it. So again, that's trying to seek that alignment between what data is being written, what data is being um, given back, and what data you can request. Okay, so yeah, for the final um, example here in the fiddle, I, um, I'm calling again that get folio data method, and a click does render the information for us here, so. I think that's all we have to, sh to show on that. Um, yeah, we'll come to this last view a little bit later, I think. Okay. Yeah, so those three examples showed you that you get data back and you have to do processing, that there is lots of different ways that you did, a lot of different APIs that exist, uh, that you can get a lot of data back, but you get to make choices about how it's displayed and what's displayed. And that uh, using an example of a folio API. And so that's um, the kind of spectrum that we were able to show with the demos. Um, so going further into the folio aspect. Um, so this diagram might be familiar to you. It's off of the uh, folio website when this is how um, the platform definition has been uh, defined. Um, and so, um, the Okapi with the API, or it's actually, I think, several APIs um, that have built the system about how the data is exchanged between the system layers um, and the applications and the toolkit. Um, and so the special interest groups have been working really carefully because the way that resource management kind of thinks about data and the way that cataloging thinks about data might not be the same, but we still want to have to make sure there's alignment between the um, Okapi and uh, what people want to do. Um, so this is our diagram again with the folio definition. Uh, James, do you want to talk maybe? Sure, and uh, this provides a little bit more precision about how uh, Okapi is playing a role in um, in this whole structure. And um, so it is um, worth noting that um, things are perhaps a bit more nuanced than is implied by this diagram. Because um, as Beth mentioned, Okapi is um, kind of, um, you know, a very heterogeneous API. It does a lot of things for a lot of different um, components. And um, as a matter of fact, Okapi um, moderates the requests that come into all the application modules. So um, when you're writing your user interface with the JavaScript there to um, hit the API, you're actually gonna hit Okapi directly and not the app directly. Um, and on, on top of that, um, Okapi also regulates the traffic between the apps and the uh, ultimate system layer where you do have your underlying storage uh, databases and um, uh, data stores and that kind of thing. So Okapi is um, kind of a, a wrapper for the, for the apps and, and, a, and an API that moderates traffic th through the apps on, on both sides of, of the interaction there. So that's um, a subtlety that um, 
may, may be helpful um, as people think about uh, you know the the role of Okapi in this larger ecosystem. And um, I do see we have one more uh, example yeah. um, website here. So let me hop on over to that real fast. Yeah, we wanted to show the the actual API um, documentation. Um, here. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the Git post and Oops. Sure, sure. That's one more um, detail about uh, web application development and the use of um, APIs over HTTP is that um, not only do you have uh, particular endpoints uh, defined by these paths, but uh, the endpoints can be addressed using different HTTP verbs. And everyone's kind of implicitly familiar with your Git and your post. Every time you enter a URL in the bar up here and press enter, you're implicitly doing a Git request at that, um, at that URL. A post is what happens when you do a form submittal, but there's a slew of other verbs that are um, implicated in HTTP, most of which um, are used by APIs and um, not by um, pure user interactions. So um, delete um, is an example of that. Um, put is, um, kind of analogous to post, but it's like adding data. So there are kind of implicit semantics for each of um, the different HTTP verbs. And uh, it's really up to developers to um, engage in the best practices when you're using these uh, requests. Um, it's, it's quite possible to write an app with just using gets and posts, um, but um, it's a, a better API if you're using deletes where you're supposed to use deletes based on the fact that a delete is supposed to be removing uh, data. Um, well, that's not a requirement, but it, it is something that makes the API easier for developers to understand. And a further advantage is that it allows you to minimize your number of endpoints. So uh, you might imagine that I had an, in, an endpoint for inventory slash items um, slash find one, another uh, that would use a get, another one that's, that's um, inventory slash items uh, slash add one. Um, and maybe another one, uh, inventory slash items slash remove one. But um, it's, uh, it's more concise and more understandable to just have the one endpoint and then have multiple verbs that act against that endpoint to achieve the different kinds of results. So it results in a much more concise um, API, a much more understandable API in my opinion. Okay, so that's to the presentation. Um. Yeah, and so all those, all that documentation is available um, off of the Folio website. Um, and so if you're interested in trying to see what data uh, is available and how what data is being, um, how you can use it, um, it's all there. So I think we just wanted to wrap up. Um, uh, in conclusion, to make sure that the that APIs are created by people and used by machines. Um, so again, we're seeking that alignment between what uh, are the user needs and what is being developed. Um, understanding how the API uh, works or what it is allows the stakeholders to understand the features and limitations of applications. And we see this a lot at the library working where we do because we build a lot of applications. So like the directory app is a good example of that. And so um, knowing what data we can get out of the directory means that we can think about how could we integrate this more with um, a different tool like my library or a good example of this also is uh, we built a uh, tool called find my librarian based off of the directory app and so find my librarian allowed us to create another data source that had subject specialties it pulled in information from the directory api and we pulled information in from the spring share libguides api so that when you search for um, engineering you got the engineering librarians i uh, got all their contact information and then it also listed all of the libguides that each of those librarians had created. Um, so knowing what we 
had the capabilities of doing means that we were being able to make a request to the developers about like this is a service that I think we need, uh, but we wouldn't be able to know what's a reasonable idea or what's even possible or have that idea of what we could dream up if we didn't quite understand what the APIs are and what they do. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, I, I think that a well constructed um, well designed API um, might surprise you and support use cases beyond the original intended use cases. But of course, then again, as you start to expand those use cases out um, into very unexpected ways, you might end up having to add on to the API or amend the API or perhaps develop a, a new API to um, complement it. Yeah. Um, and again, the way that we think about the shape of information informs the way we think about APIs. And once again, that alignment between the users and programmers. Um, if the data is not there, there's no way to get the data, or if there's no way to make that request, then there's no way to do that. So we really want to make sure that um, whenever we create things, um, that they can expand if needed, um, mm -hmm. and that uh, they meet our needs. So any final, final thoughts, James? Well, um, I guess maybe the last thing I'd say would be that uh, an API is going to be kind of an expression of, like you said, the way you think about the data. Mm -hmm. Because the, um, the endpoints and the verbs you have on the endpoints uh, really imply a certain way of thinking about the data. Like here are the things that we care about in our business and here are the things you can do to those things. So it, um, it, it locks you into a certain way of thinking, but that's also the way you write applications. All right, all right. so I think uh, we're ready for questions if there are any today. Uh... So if you have any questions, please do uh, add them into the Q&A section of Zoom. I have a question just to start things off. Do you guys have any suggested resources uh, for people that want to learn more about APIs? Sure. Um, I think one, the JS Fiddle is really interesting because you can take um, I think a lot of people have access to libguides and so there's a libguides API there. And so you can start playing with APIs um, using a tool that you already have access to. So I think JS Fiddle is a really interesting thing uh, to learn more. Uh, Lynda.com has some uh, API references. Um, maybe in the, when we post the slides, uh, there's a, um, a recent, um, oh, I for, I'm blanking on who, put it out, but it's APIs for librarians. And so they have some code snippets that you can look at and see how, um, I think they have it for Spring Share as well as um, a couple of other common library tools. Um, so, so those are just some ones that come to mind. Yeah. So we did get one question so far. Uh, the slides mention HTTP, will Folio not be using HTTPS? Well, I've not been um, developing directly on the Folio project, but I'm confident it will be using HTTPS. Can you talk about the difference between HTTP and HTTPS? Uh, HTTPS is just HTTP where the requests and the responses are encrypted so that third parties listening in on the internet will not be aware of the content. Okay. Are there any other questions? I think we can go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, this concludes today's Folio Forum. You can continue the conversation at the Folio Discussion website. What about Easy I'm Proxy? Sorry. Got a question. All right. Could you exp uh, span a little bit more about uh, what you mean about what about Easy Proxy? Uh, 
do you work with easy proxy at all? Um, so I have not um, had occasion to code directly against easy proxy, but um, my feeling there would be that easy proxy um, itself uh, exposes an API and um, yeah, pr presumably there's work being done under the auspices of the Folio project to um, achieve an integration between Folio and Easy Proxy because I know it is it does provide for some very important use cases in the library community. So um, I unfortunately don't have any specific intelligence about how that development's been proceeding. And I haven't heard of any anything specific either, but I, it's an integral part of of what we do. You know, most many libraries use it, so I, I can't see that it wouldn't play a part. It'd be interesting to um, use an API in Easy Proxy uh, through Folio to populate the Easy Proxy um, data. Uh, I'm assuming that's what the interest is here. All right, so you can continue the conversation at the Folio discussion website, discuss.folio.org, and on Twitter using the hashtag Folio Forum. The recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the openlibraryenvironment.org website. If you have feedback on this forum or have an idea for a future forum, please contact the forum facilitators at facilitators at olay-lists.openlibraryfoundation.org. Our next Folio Forum is scheduled for February 7th and will be an update of the work that's been done by the Folio Management, Metadata Management Special Interest Group. Uh, you can get to that same website for more details and the link to, the, to register. Thank you to our speakers, Beth German and James Creel, and, er, and to everyone who asked questions and added comments. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel.